Sprint. Um, we're just here to launch the latest edition of uh, the Democratic Intellect. Uh, now, I, my name is Murdoch MacDonald, and I'm here essentially because I'm an old student of George Davy. And Richard, also, yeah. my co-editor, is also an old student of George Davy. So that's really what that, this is about. Um, numerous thanks. First of all, to WordPower for hosting the, the, the launch, but uh, WordPower is not simply a bookshop hosting a launch. WordPower is, a, if you like, an expression of the democratic intellect. I mean, what George is writing about in here is very much what goes on in this bookshop. I mean, the, the interdependence of different areas, mutually illuminating one another, illuminating their blind spots, philosophy, illuminating poetry, poetry, not enough mathematics, Tarlosh, and I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> Should be a, a large... Oh, good. Really. Oh, that's, that's excellent. That's excellent. You can advise Tarlosh on what to put in. Um, so this is an utterly fascinating book. Now, the, uh, the form of the evening will be that I'll kind of warble on for a while, and then I'll hand over to Richard, who will do something incredibly philosophically significant. <laughs> I, think, I think incredibly is the right word. Yeah, yeah. More, certainly, at the very least, incredible, whether it's philosophical, philosophical, philosophically significant or not. But um, I just, uh, because the other uh, credit here has to go to uh, Edinburgh University Press and their absolutely excellent um, history uh, editor at the moment, John Watson, uh, because um, when I approached John to see if it would be possible to get another edition of the, the Democratic Intellect out. Um, he essentially jumped at the opportunity, and this book has been through various vicissi vicissitudes in, in terms of being published, but despite, uh, despite those uh, difficulties, it's nevertheless been more or less in print since it first came out in 1961. It's been an incredibly influential book uh, through its extraordinary ability to explore different areas of academic experience and to suggest the relationships between them. Now I'm just going to read the uh, just going to read the contents page because it struck me that that was the easiest thing to do because it's really near the front. <laughs> uh, but it gives you a really good idea of what's going on in, in George's thinking. The, the contents page starts yeah. off by saying yeah. there's an introduction by Murdoch MacDonald and Richard. Um, oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, yes. yeah. Oh, God, I meant to say that Richard and I actually edited it as well. Yeah, but I thought you all knew that anyway. But, well. uh, but okay. <laughs> okay, right. Back to the beginning. The new edition is edited by uh, Richard Gunn and Murdoch MacDonald, and we've also written the introduction. And the preface uh, is written by Lindsay Patterson, who un unfortunately can't be here tonight. But I just want to give you an idea of what goes on in the book. I'm, I'm not going to read every chapter title, but um, one of the chapters, for example, is called Mathematics Without Metaphysics. Now, isn't that a fascinating idea, you know? I mean, it really is. How, you don't normally think about metaphysics and mathematics in the same, uh, in the same breath at all. And then you get... Um, the humanistic basis of Scottish science, geometry or algebra. So suddenly we have a book called The Democratic Intellect, which we know has a lot about philosophy in it, we know has, has a lot about literature in it, and suddenly we find we're, we're looking at mathematics. How, how can that be the case? At the moment, it's just not the sort of thing we do in universities at all. But universities at the moment, and indeed education in general, splits the mind up in the way that in, in, in ways that the mind is not actually split up. And what George's great uh, attempt to do was, was to um, allow education to come back in. Yeah, yeah, come, come and get a seat. Come, and a glass of wine or whatever, yeah. Oh, great. Where's Donald? Oh, good, good. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so the, but immediately after the humanist, humanistic base, basis of Scottish science, you have the vernacular basis of Scottish humanism, which, of course, is about Robert Burns. So we have an immediate linkage between what's going on on the scientific side and the mathematical side and what's going on on the literary side. And it's that kind of linkage, linkage that makes this book 
such an important book. Uh, it doesn't say, I mean, these days we have, I don't know, lots of projects saying, oh, let's put art and science together and all that sort of thing. In, in George's work, the distinction between art and science um, is obviously there because you're doing different things. I mean, mathematicians are doing different things from poets. But the, the whole ethos of the book is that it is not impossible for a mathematician to understand what a poet is doing and, and for a poet to understand what a mathematic, mathematician is doing. And that's where on, uh, the whole notion of the democratic intellect comes in, because remember that the democratic intellect is on the one hand uh, a societal thing, uh, essentially saying that certainly intellectuality is open to all, but on the other hand it's a cognitive thing. It's saying that one part of the mind, we all have, if you like, democratically distributed parts of our mind. We all we can all do maths, we can all to an extent, we can all do poetry Some to an extent. We all think scientifically and, te and technically. You know, if you're cooking something, you're thinking scientifically and, se and technically. Um, and we all we all write things, etc. These these are what gets expressed in our universities, even though we might not think of it that way. Is in fact um, an expression of our own minds. Now, obviously, individuals, individual people are. are better at different aspects of things. But the whole point is that what the 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 fundamental um, ethos of what George is getting across is the fact that the universities are about us. They're not about some abstracted thing that doesn't relate to us. And I was particularly delighted by Edinburgh University Press's uh, enthusiasm to pick up on my suggestion for the cover because uh, it was actually a picture from the Roscosh Academy uh, which showed Burns's monument. Now, unfortunately, due to the design process, Burns's monument is actually on, 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 on this bit. But nevertheless, the actual point was, and the point is still made, which was that uh, now that wasn't their fault. That, that, was, that really wasn't their fault. It was my fault for not thinking through the dimensions of the picture. But the actual point of that was to draw attention to the fact that Burns's Monument, as I'm sure you're all aware in Edinburgh, is an extraordinary work of Greek revival architecture. That is to say, it is a work that is constructed on very, very sound principles of geometry. It's, it's about Euclid as much as it is about Burns. Now, of course, Burns although he's not normally credited with writing about Euclid, he did write about Euclid. He was extremely interested in geometry, as so many Enlightenment figures were, and as we should be today. So the point being made here, which is actually made equally well by the building that survives on the cover, which is the Royal High School, uh, which is a superb, superbly proportioned uh, Greek Revival building, one of the most important in the world, and, you know, it is one of the most important in the world, um, is, is the point is made very well by uh, what is in fact on the cover, namely that what George is writing about here, which is essentially the, the universities in the 19th century, uh, here we have a 19th century building from Edinburgh, which is dealing with exactly those principles of mathematics on the one hand and culture on the other. And if we'd got the Burns Monument in as well, we'd have had the full literary reference because all these things for George come together very strongly. Now, the, the interesting thing is about the, the geometrical side, which might seem a strange place for me to um, explore here. But the interesting thing is that, of course, if you think about a geometrical approach to mathematics, you're immediately thinking spatially. And if you think about a generalist approach to knowledge, you're, in a metaphorical sense at least, immediately thinking spatially as well. So the idea of defending a mathematics that takes geometry seriously is not a million miles away from the idea of defending a, uh, a view of knowledge that takes generalism seriously. And so there's this intrinsic link between the mathematicians of Edinburgh in the 19th century defending geometry and the, their, their wider colleagues, including themselves, defending the notion of a generalist education where it was possible for one area of thought to coexist happily with another area of thought and not for each area to assume that it could be reduced into the other so that one area becomes dominant. 
um, but actually uh, in, in Georgie's terms, to insist that one area of thought illuminates the blind spots, the methodological blind spots in another area. And that's the crucial message of, of the democratic intellect. Um, and it's just great to, to have people here uh, this evening uh, interested in the launch. And finally, I'd note that, again, uh, thanks to John Watson at uh, Edinburgh University Press, um, one of the major fans of uh, George's work, George Davies' work, uh, who is also a major uh, fan of the work of word power, is, of course, the author Jim Kelman. And I was very pleased indeed when I got the proofs of the cover and saw the quote from Jim Kelman on it, a truly seminal work in the Scottish intellectual tradition, because that's what it is. So um, at, at this point, uh, I'd just like to hand over to my co-editor, Richard. And just to introduce Richard, he's one of the, the great um, Richard Gunn, to give him his absolutely full name. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Richard has been one of the great theoretical presences in uh, Edinburgh thinking uh, all the time he, he was working at Edinburgh University. Uh, Richard has not actually published anything like as much as he should have, so get on with it. <laughs> what sort of evening is that? <laughs> <laughs> pressure, pressure. No, that's what I'm, I'm just repeating to wash, you know. So, and word power is about to put, put out the complete works of Richard Gunn. Uh, but he is, uh, I think, one of the most uh, valued uh, thinkers from a, a political and a political, philosophical, and societal perspective. And uh, without Richard, uh, some of the most interesting bits of George's second book, The Christ of the Dem Democratic Intellect, would never have been written. Well, it is true, because there was this one passage that Richard put in as a linking passage, and lots of people quoted it in reviews, saying this was really did explain what the book was about. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note, Richard, I'll hand over to you. Yes, thank you very much for, the, for something. Yeah. <laughs> thank you to, to, to Word Power. Um, for having us. Um, I'm, I'm going to soar back, so I'm going to sit down while I talk to you, so I'm afraid you're going to have to put up with, with that. If you can't see me or hear me or anything, kind of try to do semaphore signs or, or something like that. Um, yes, but that, that, this, this mysterious passage in the crisis of the democratic intellect, I, I um, remember um, telling George at one point that um, I actually suggested this passage so that I could later quote it, and he thought that was hysterically funny. <laughs> I think, well, you did. You told him that. I remember him roaring with laughter at that, this idea, yeah. because I think that actually I think there's a serious point in the back of this, yeah, which is, is that, 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 that George uh, Davy always saw um, book writing and the production of an intellectual kind of artifact like a, a book, and, and, and if you like dialogical terms. It's the outcome of conversation and, 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 and interaction, and that conversation and interaction, which brings different perspectives and viewpoints into play, is very much the, 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 the stuff of common sense and the, 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 the interplay of perspectives <laughs> in, in the, the democratic intellect is something that was very important to, 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 to George Davy in his book, and also in his, 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 his subsequent book, the the crisis of the democratic intellect, which carries the story of of, of um, Scottish universities forward into the present. Um, so yes, that's the kind of transitional kind of thing. But I'm I'm sorry. I'm, I, I stand up. I'll stand up sometimes. I'll sit sit, sit down. Um, the the um, as as Murdo mentioned. I, I don't know what time it is here. Yeah, right, okay. Um, they, they, uh, as Murdo mentioned, um, I, I, I was one of George's um, pupils at Edinburgh University. If you, I think I was a pupil before you yeah, were. But, yeah, but I, I do remember he was, he was a very, in a way, demanding tutor. He would, I remember the first time we ever saw him in a, in a, a, a tutorial. Um, we'd all re 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 handed in some essay or some, some 
kind. And uh, George, or Dr. Davy, as it was to, the, to us, us then, um, said that, that most of the, 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 the essays were really quite standard, really quite boring. That was me, of course, as, as well. But there was, only, there was one um, that had really addressed fundamental issue, and this was to do, and this essay turned out to be about whether philosophical questions were really psychological questions. And George, of course, thought they were philosophical questions. Um, and so basically he tore this character apart. So sort of, what about this? What about that? And the guy was quaking. With this kind of, yeah. so, so anyway, he was a very, kind of, very challenging and vigorous, um, if quite in many ways eccentric kind of um, kind of tutor. And another story I wanted to tell you about George Davy style as a, as a lecturer. Um, he was, in, although he was very involved in conversation and interaction, common sense in that sense, he was also a, a man who almost had, a, a, had his, his line of thought would be sort of trickling along in his own, his own, and, and, and his own mind. And I remember once upon a time, he was giving a lecture to a group of students in a lecture kind of seminar room. It was about Descartes, I think. Um, and, uh, but it, it had wandered over to some, the, the discussion was about, um, James the Sixth and the, the introduction of the, the gold standard. Or something. I don't know what it was really about. And George was talking about this. He had a. He said he, he had a book that he wanted to cons consult to make his point. And 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 so he then left the room, and his own office was further down the, the hall. And we heard this voice sort of receding down <laughs> into, and oh, 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 going on about gold standard, and, and we sat, we sat waiting for something to kind of, kind of happen. We thought he'd sort of come back with his book, and what we heard was this voice disappearing into the dim afternoon mist, and, and, and then the pause, and then this voice sort of gradually came back into focus. Yes, <laughs> and 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 he sat, and he was talking as he was going, and he sat down, and and, and went on with his. Just as, as, as where, where, and in fact, the lecture had been going on in his mind while he had gone off to his office and dug out his books and looked up his bits and and and, come, and he wasn't really aware, I think, that, that the, 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 there had been any gap whatsoever, and you were just meant to pick up what was going on. It so was, was a charming and lovely man, and a very intense man at, at, at the same at the same time. Um, I could, I could go on telling you George Davy, um, very affectionate George Davy stories. But actually, I, I can't resist one last one. It's not really so funny. It's just it, it, it stuck in my mind. <clears throat> I remember we were, he was, it was about a lecture was on David Hume's um, Treatise of Human Nature, which, as you probably know, is a rather big, thick, difficult book. And obviously, the students had been not getting on very well with, with with the treatise of human nature, and George, I remember him standing at the front of a lecture hall, and, and he, he he explained that, that that he said reading a book is a bit like carrying a plank, yeah. And he gave the, the and oh, why could this, but he gave the reason for this, which is that if you're carrying a plank on your shoulder, if you get the center of gravity for or, or, or behind. Um, it's very, very difficult to carry the plank. It's, it's very, very heavy. Yeah, to, to, you can't support it. It's a bit like trying to read a book and remembering all the difficult, complicated things that David. But if you get the, the center of gravity on your shoulder, it's really easy to carry the plank. Yeah, and everything falls into place. And it always struck me as a kind of ever since you know from then on, I've read books by by Hegel and about Kant and by by John Rawls and goodness knows what. And it's always this metaphor is always stuck in the back of my mind. If you get the center of gravity right, then everything falls into place. Even the inconsistencies of the author fall into place in an interesting kind of kind, kind of way. So that's one of the things I, I think I carried away from George's teaching uh, most um, on a most long-standing kind of basis. Now, what I really wanted to tell you about were actually more complicated. Things I don't think I've got much time to do that. So what will I do with that? I don't know. I can't even. Michelle, your watch is so small I can't even see what it says. Yes, right. Okay, we're, we've got a little bit of time here. I think. 
Um, if I go on too long, just riot, riot or revolt or something. <laughs> 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 Some kind of way. Yeah. What I wanted to, to, to tell you about were, were um, some things that actually some of you will have heard versions of this before in, in, in the Ragged University, in the meeting Ragged University, where I talked about common sense. And I talked about <laughs> common sense under a couple of different headings. I want to use the same headings um, this, this afternoon. Um, first of all, what I want to tell to, I want the, the, the sort of philosophy, the generalist philosophy, which George Davy draws upon in the democratic intellect and in the crisis of the democratic intellect is common sense philosophy and Scottish 18th century onwards is, is quite well known as, as launching the idea of, of common sense philosophy. Now the notion of common sense philosophy isn't all isn't a new thing in the 18th century. It goes way back to ancient Rome and ancient Greece and so on and, and so forth. So there's a long-standing tradition of what the notion of common sense means. And I thought I would try to explain briefly to what, um, what, what I think the term common sense means in relation to George Davies' work. This actually gives you an idea of how you might want to approach this book, the, the, the crisis of the, well, the, the democratic intellect, and also the crisis of the democratic intellect. It is a difficult book. It goes through quite a lot of, despite you brought out the nice things and the nasty things, but it's really quite detailed, and you've got to think your way through each bit as you go. Yeah, I'm going already, Richard. You're going away? <laughs> I wasn't going to criticise you all that strongly. You know? <laughs> He's going about as far as the wine. <laughs> 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 well, the, 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 there's, it seems to me there are two chapters in this book that are, are, are really pivotal ones um, from the standpoint of the kind of the, the philosophical underpinning of the, the book. One of them is in chapter is chapter eleven called "A Metropolis of Common Sense," and what um, the, the, the chapter does is it tells you really what the word common sense means in its, its 18th and 19th century Scottish um, meaning. Um, the, the metropolis of common sense, metropolis concerned uh, is the, the um, if, well, mainly Edinburgh, but it's Glasgow as well, the metropolis of conversation in the, 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 in the, the Scottish Enlightenment period. So chapter 11 gives you a good idea of what common sense means, but it's a slightly frustrating chapter because when I was looking at this chapter a while ago, I was trying to work out, surely you must get a, a passage in it where George Davy tells you what he thinks the word common sense means. What's his working definition of common sense? No luck. You, 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 <laughs> won't, find, you won't find such a thing. What he does is he continually quotes other people's views, other educationalist views, other philosophers' views. This, he reconstructs the, the argument, the discussion, that was going on in, in, in Edinburgh and Glasgow at that time. Um, and I think that is actually, in a way, the whole point. What common sense is, is a conversation, yeah, which underlies the discussion of ideas. So in a sense, he's illustrating in practice his meaning of the term common sense. But you won't find, unfortunately, in chapter 11, though it is an important and useful chapter, it won't, you won't find, I don't think, unless you're more lucky than me, um, you, you won't find George's own definition of what common sense means. So I thought I would tell you why I thought common sense means very, very quickly. It means two things, and this, this goes way back to, to, to classical thought. It's not just a, a, a 18th century Scottish <laughs> thing. Um, the, the term, Latin term sensus communis um, means roughly something like shared sense, but shared sense can be, a sense can be shared in two different meanings. Murdo has kind of alluded to this, but I'm just saying it slightly more systematically. Um, on the one hand, you can have a sense <laughs> which is shared by a number of individual human beings. Like we in this room have maybe a, a shared meaning or sense. Perhaps the term common sense means something to us in, in, in this room. It's, it's a, a public sense and interconnected a sense that brings in the interconnection between individuals there's more than one individual is involved in the idea of common sense i suppose uh, no 
Well, I was going to say, I'll say it anyhow, but then you can ignore what I was going to say. I mean, the term common sense is a bit like the way that some people talk about ideology. Yeah, an ideology is something that people share. But let's forget about ideology. That's a red, red, red herring. So I didn't really say, I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> that was very well not said. <laughs> Thank you. I'm good, good at not saying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Um, in, in fact, one of the, 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 the 18th century translations of the term, Latin term sensus communis into what we term common sense translations into English is, is Francis Hutchison, who talks about what he calls public sense. Yeah, public with a nice K at the end, end of it. Um, so the notion of common sense as, as public sense illustrates this notion of a sense which is shared by more than one 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 in, in individual, but it's a shared public thing. Uh, more than one individual involved. Um, so that's one meaning of census communis. The other meaning is is, is the following: a sense can be shared by the different five senses of the individual. Yeah, and the, the, the sight, sound, touch. The, 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 these kind of Things and each one of us, as an individual, looks around the world, and we we come up. There's, for instance, a thing here which is sort of feels sort of smooth and, and round, and also it looks smooth and round at the same time. So how uh, the question is how do does does the information that we get through our different senses totalize and come together into a coherent view of the world? And the the the, the the answer to that question is that the senses totalize together, they come together in common sense, yeah? A sense that is common to the other five senses. And um, the uh, kind of um, mystical idea of, of a sixth sense that you've probably all come across, yes? That, 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 I suppose, must be the origin of the term common sense back in people like Aristotle and Aquinas and ancient Greece and Middle Ages and so on um, and so forth. And common sense in this second meaning, common sense as a sense that is shared and common to the five senses, um, each one of us has common sense in that meaning. We don't, you don't just have one individual and you've got common sense in this meaning, the second meaning of the term, because each one of us has got the five senses, each one of us puts together the different bits of the senses, the different sensory bits of information, we put them together into a coherent view of the world and that bit looks round and that bit looks as though it's jagged and so on and, and, and so forth. Um, and this second meaning of co common sense, um, it, you also find that in, in, in uh, Scottish 18th century philosophy as well. Um, I, again, I, won't, I could look up um, documentation about books and things here in my bag, but I won't because I'm in a rush. Um, Thomas Reed, for instance, uses the word, the term common sense to mean the, 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 the sixth sense that totalizes the five senses that each one in each individual has. But he also sometimes uses the term common sense in its interconnected, um, if you like, social or public kind of meaning as well. And the question, obviously, for a philosopher like like me, educated by George David, is how do these two meanings of common sense fit together? Do they fit together? Are they are they two completely separate kind of kind of things? And I think I can I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I can tell you what I would like the answer to be. Yeah, which is that they come they, they, they each we have one of them because we've got the other. Yeah, they each they're they're interdependent. Yeah, it's it's because we are are, are totalized coherent adult individuals that we can interact with other people, yeah? Um, but it's also because we interact with other people in a coherent conversational way, many-sided way, that we can have coherent experience on our own individual basis. So the two things come together. And, and in fact, this notion of the two things coming together, which I rushed over too quickly, but we can talk about it afterwards. Um, it, it's an idea which you find not only in Scottish um, thought of the 18th century, but um, in 
in, in, in a whole number of, 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 of philosophers and writers and through into the, the 19th and 20th centuries, I would want to argue one of my philosophical heroes, um, Hegel, uh, wants to think in those, those terms, for instance, um, Wittgenstein, especially later Wittgenstein notions of public meaning, would want to say that these two things intersect with each other. Um, Fairburn, the, the, the object relations psychoanalyst, yeah, would want to say, I think, the same kind of thing. So in quite different departments, Habermas's um, communicates up uh, about pragmatics and communications, is sort of the same kind of thing. So there's a whole number of areas in thought in the 20th century where this kind of interplay, uh, in effect, the two notions of common sense are, are, are operating together. And uh, the other thing I was going to tell you about, I won't forget it. I don't think I've got time, really. Do I? Well, what I was going to say in any case but, well, to, to, uh, was that in this book, the two notions of common sense interweave with each other. And also that's the case, I think, in the, the, the crisis of the democratic intellect which follows on from this and as to this um mystical passage that that a, a linking passage that we were talking about a minute ago it, i think what it says is that the, the two types of common sense do actually mm -hmm. depend upon each each other and i i remember putting that bit that linking bit in because i wanted the two bits to link together <laughs> and now you know the true editorial process <laughs> yes yeah, so, so nothing that you've got to don't talk to anybody outside the room about this <laughs> yeah. um what, what what time is it because i can't oh, I, I can't make people to watch well look you tell me what it is. Um, <laughs> Twenty to seven. Twenty to seven. Right. Well, look, look, what I was going to tell you about, I won't tell you about. But I'll tell you what it was. <laughs> I was going to talk about the notion of, of of common sense and the relation between the idea of common sense and the idea of a general education, because quite often the notion of common sense and the notion of a general education go very closely together um, in uh, Scottish thought um, and uh, George himself is, it very much emphasizes the importance of a general education in Scottish universities. And I, 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 what I will do is point you to the chapter where I think that idea is most clearly and, and potently introduced in uh, it's, it's the first chapter. Um, there's a chapter which is called um, the Presbyterian Inheritance. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but I don't think there's anything whatsoever about Presbyterians and their inheritance in that chapter. Well, <laughs> well I mean, the way I'd see it, Richard, is that um, for, for, for George, the Presbyterian inheritance was essentially the inheritance of an extremely uh, flat hierarchy that was secularized. So as a result, you could get... Sorry, flat hierarchy? Well, well, I mean, Presbyterianism having as little hierarchy in it as possible. Oh, I see. When, when you secularize it, ah. you get um, a very potentially uh, level playing field for different areas of thought. I think that's what George was on about there. That's very interesting because it actually relates to another thing I want to say about Scottish thought, which is that there is a continuity that leads from, indeed, the Presbyterian phase over into the Scottish yep. Enlightenment phase of that kind. Wait. But that's maybe a separate conversation we can yeah. have. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. But uh, anyway, OK, you sit down. Well, I think there's so many things coming out there, particularly at the end, because um, and it actually gets me back to right where I began, which was with uh, uh, the fact that uh, word power is very much part of this democratic intellectualist tradition because one of the uh, books that they published a while back was actually the, the letters of Rabindranath Tagore and Patrick Geddes. And of course, Patrick Geddes is very much part of this, uh, this Presbyterian, uh, this secularized Presbyterian inheritance of thought um, that George is talking about here. And of course, George mentions Geddes as a representative mm. of democratic intellect intellectualism here. But I really just wanted to say one further thing about what Richard was saying there, which is to um, draw your attention to um, essentially the 
uh, the slight difference of this edition from earlier editions, which is, of course, the, the introduction. What I've done in the, in the first part of the introduction is just to essentially talk a little about George's life. The second part of the introduction, Richard, in three or four pages, has uh, really, I think, made a real significant contribution to the scholarship by going over some of the issues that he's, he's talked about here obviously in a very concise way, but I think a very important way. So um, if you want to begin to pursue uh, what Richard is saying here, then the second half of the introduction is, is actually a very good place to start. Now, I'm, I'm sure, I, I don't want to over-formalise the event, but I'm, but I'm sure there are a few questions, uh, particularly mm -hmm. to Richard, if, if people would like to, to ask them. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not only have I got sort of back, I've got bunged up eyes, so, uh, ears. <laughs> <laughs> a few cents just coming together. So, <laughs> can, can you shout loudly? So, so, so as, a, as a mathematician, I'm entering an arena that I'm not really familiar with. I'm learning, mm. but I'm not aware of this concept of the common sense mm. philosophy. Mm. What I was struck by listening to it is that in science, there are sort of famous scientists who have commented on the structure of science, Einstein in particular, mm -hmm. who describes science as nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. Oh, yeah, so yeah, there's yeah, yeah. an interesting linkage there, so a real practicality. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, any yeah. yeah. Print. Sort of notes of that in the scientific oh. arena in the Enlightenment period? Well, I mean, if I, if I could pick up on that one, I think... Uh, Einstein's very interesting because Einstein and indeed Stephen Hawking, they're all utterly dedicated visual thinkers. And of course, it's a visual thinking tradition that is one of the things that George is, is defending here. And the other interesting thing is that the actual visual thinking of Scottish, uh, visual thinking tradition of Scottish geometry in the 19th century and indeed the 18th century is actually defending the visual thinking that was done by Newton. And you know how Newton's calculus was essentially a, a principia was purely geometric. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then Leibniz was more algebraic, and that's the one that got picked up. And uh, so, so the whole um, the whole dynamic is a defence of visual thinking. Uh, so, so I mean, that's the only thing that I would be able to contribute to that. But Richard may be able to. No, it, 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 um, it's the kind of question that makes me. Think, what do I really what do I really mean by common sense what what is it to have a common sense perspective on on, on, on something in, in my own thinking and I, I don't know I thought the one thing I could like, to avoid the, the, the force of that question so I don't really have to try to, to answer it properly I thought it might be helpful if I read out just very quickly um, what uh, Thomas Reed um, who was the the, 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 the the chief 18th century Scottish philosopher, common sense philosopher. Um, had to say about it. It's an, in, in, an inquiry into the human mind on the principles of common sense. There's not a lot where he actually talks about the notion of common sense. I mean, by, he didn't talk much about the term common sense in it, but what he says is, is if there are certain principles, as I think there are, which the constitution of our mind <clears throat> leads us to believe, and which we are under a necessity to take for granted in the common concerns of life without being able to give a reason for them, these are what we call the principles of common sense. Yeah, okay, that's what that's it is. Kind of, and what, 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 implying a common sense perspective on something, it, it, it's not so much that I, 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 for me, talking about common sense isn't, doesn't involve kind of saying, ah, well, these are the fixed principles that I kind of find in, 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 inside myself. Um, and it certainly doesn't involve me, I don't think, in, in saying, ah, well, in this particular group, whatever it might be, my family or Scotland or whatever it might be, that's what counts as, as, as common sense. It's more that it's these, it's these principles which are, whatever he calls them, that, 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 that are, are, um, which we take for granted in the common concerns um, of life. It, 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 for, for me, it, what it always makes me think of is that when, if I try to say, well, these are the things that are taken for granted, 
I always think of some particular group of people taking it for granted, some specialist audience, let's say, scientific audience, historically, or, or, or just people in the street or whatever. And then I always think, well, now, any audience or any group that I'm thinking of, I can always think of there's all other people as well. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's them and there's the people outside. There's people in this room and there's the people outside. There's always people outside. And to appeal to common sense is to actually is not to appeal to the fixed and given set of views that characterize some particular group, as I say, be they scientists or 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 bigots or or people in the pub or whatever it might be, is is always to 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 hold it off the hold open the idea that somebody else could have joined the could join the conversation from outside, yeah, with some fresh set of perspective. It's always talking with with that sense of common <laughs> sense transcends any one particular group and is a broader kind of kind of thing. And again, trying to talk about some idea or write some that something about an idea in a commonsensical way always goes beyond some whatever specialist um, audience yeah one might be addressing at the time. It's addressing them, of course, but it's always trying to bring somebody else into the conversation. And some, so the, the tone of common sense philosophy <laughs> is a kind of tone that involves. Um, how can I put it? Non-patronizing introductions. Yeah, it's not a matter of saying this is a specialism. I will now tell you about it. You know, looking down. It's like saying it's always like appealing to someone else. It's like, this is what we do here. That makes sense, doesn't it? There's always a kind of question. So yeah, attached to. I want to throw in a couple of things that, that spark off. So the first thing is that Euclidean geometry uh, originates from a very common sense issue: <coughs> building, and so the axiomatization of Euclidean geometry was, I guess, the consolidation mm. of what was common sense understanding, what was presumed to be mm. definitely true, upon which one could build theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you talk about this other, because there was a large period of time where the parallel line posture yeah, 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 occupied yeah. the minds yeah, of geometers, yeah. wondering whether or not yeah. they could prove that independent yes. as, a, as a consequence of existing mm -hmm. axioms. And it wasn't until the 19th century with the discovery of alternative geometries, yeah. basically those geometries which yeah. violate yeah. the Romanian yeah. geometries. Yeah. So, yeah. so the last thing, just, this is now defeated in the modern era. Yeah. Geometry yeah. is now seeing a resurgence, yeah. and not just because of subjects like general relativity, mm. which is uh, astronomy mm. and the role of yeah. these non-Euclidean geometries, mm. but it's also entering into the world of biology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is this uh, beautiful... So a product of geometry, which is again non Romanian, yeah. which is being uh, applied to things like the shape of a leaf, mm -hmm. for example, yeah, explained yeah. using concepts mm -hmm. that uh, link to these non standard geometries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to say the same thing on this, but you go and say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, uh, Thomas Reed actually developed a, an early non Euclidean geometry, and that would be 18th century. In, in this same, same book. <laughs> so, uh, uh, no, um, that predates uh, Riemann. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Well, hang on, it would have to, wouldn't it? Yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. When when was it? Uh, Seventeen sixty-four. So, so I mean, that's all entirely consistent with what you said. Mm. Uh, no, um, yeah, that's it. Right. I, I think conversations are going to go on and on here, mm. and uh, but I'm I'm aware that Peter is here. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Hello. Yeah. Long time though, sir. Yeah, long time though. Um, I I think partly to do with the, uh, I came across George Davy through Andy McPherson. Uh, I was involved with the uh, CES, but it was then, so it was all about trying to look at governance within Scottish schooling and some of that mm -hmm. um, tradition. Um, but later on, I sort of drifted away from that. But what it seems to me that's going on in this conversation is about, um, uh, as you say, different perspectives on what is what is manifest before us. Mm -hmm. Um, and we try and seek explanation of what is manifest before us. I don't think personally it works very well when you move over to things which, like brain scans, aren't very manifest to most of us. Uh, you know, the, the, there is a sense in which some of those are not common sense. We mm. don't have an angle on that, and they, you know, it'll take quite a little while perhaps before they come back in to be mm. accessible. Normally, get mine straight to my iPhone. Well, there you go. <laughs> 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 but the there the the so I think partly what the common sense is to do with um, 
consensus around what is manifest and different mm. explanations mm. for that. Mm. And you're right, it's it's one that doesn't close down the explanation mm. and say, this is how it is. Yeah. But it is a way of saying, well, this is how it is as far as we see it, but, you know, you've got different perspectives. So, you know, the further north you go, the colder you get, you know, but mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily work if you're in the southern hemisphere. But so we haven't got anyone. So, you know, we have yeah. some general belief that actually yeah. uh, that happens yeah. the further you, you know, and we we will get a consensus around mm -hmm. that, you know, mm -hmm. um, but then it might fall apart because mm -hmm. somebody else brings in something else. Um, yeah. But I think it's I think it's more attached to the manifest, you know, that is say what's evident in front of us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than theorizing per se, you know. So there is some conjecture about models mm -hmm. necessarily, mm -hmm. but I think uh, it's grounded in in what we perceive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that so where he deals with a lot to do with education, it's, it's the intellectual level which we also perceive, mm -hmm. even though we you know it's invisible in some sense, but we do perceive it. Mm -hmm. We do have some engagement with it mm -hmm. in the same way we don't necessarily have engagement with what you see through a microscope or what you see through some things which we call science because they they actually mm. dig into a reality in a way which isn't open to most of us you know so it isn't but but again i think also the the tradition is and the reason some of those things were uh, occurring was because there was such so radical change going on mm -hmm. i mean if you could imagine which we find hard mm -hmm. to imagine what was happening with the agricultural revolution the industrial mm -hmm. revolution yeah. the manufacture of yeah. these things and you know, the, 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 the discovery of places that were afar mm. and the ability to, you know, see a banana when you, you know, and all of those things, which yeah. were amazing, yeah. where we've only discovered second half of electricity, so to speak. You know, it, well, we've had change, but they had very radical manifest change. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think you're yeah. completely right about that. When the term common sense can sound... I think wrongly, but it can sound as though it's a very static kind of thing. Mm, there is mm. common sense that you know a chair is a chair is a chair, and a mm. you know, glass is a glass of glass, and that's sort of that, 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 that we kind of. Whereas actually, common sense philosophy was thriving in in Scotland in a period, of, a, in a period of change. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. and it's, it's the things that are just on the edge of every meaning that mm. are, are the important kind, of, and that's why the, I think the generalism comes in a, and is important because it's when someone attempts to introduce an idea or a specialism, whatever it might be, is to somebody, to people who are not involved in that. But also the, yeah. the isms and analogies yeah. hadn't been invented sufficiently mm, to right. explain what was yeah. going on. You know, yeah. that happened later on that yeah. we had sort of, yeah. you know, yeah. splitters, you know, <laughs> so you had to be a, a one, well, one no, you know, no, yes, yes, specialization. Yes. You know, yeah. there was a sense yeah. in which you, yeah. there wasn't enough common agreement in any sense because yeah. you, you know, or rather mm. you, you didn't have enough separate agreements. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, yes, I mean, just, just in, 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 going on, but, uh, I'm not disagreeing with what you're, what, what you're saying at all. I mean, it, it just to, to, to add in that, 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 that they, these conversations just across the boundaries of a discipline mm. or, to, or to people who are not yet induced into the discipline are precisely the conversations, the interactions where philosophical fundamental mm. issues and principles get, get, get raised. Once... A, a, a specialism is up and running and it's all people can say oh well, what you do is you do this you do this you do this and nobody is asking a, a fundamental kind of thing it's at the beginning of things or when you put two specialisms together mm. yeah that, 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 that well, it's also an appeal to the sort of Thomas Huxley thing about you know you need to know something about everything as well as yeah. everything about something I, I think we're definitely getting into the conversational mode all right okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I think you. if I could take one Thank one you. more formal question and then we can definitely get into the uh, conversational I mode I can't tell the difference yeah, yeah, I know you. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's why I'm chairing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I was going to ask you, you were editing um, George Davies' work. Did you actually change anything? Or of course not. Did you just... <laughs> no, in, but remember, Richard... Do the actually, introduction and the... Well, actually, uh, the, real, the real purpose was to make sure... Kept in print mm -hmm. and yeah. and also dropped in price mm -hmm. uh, because there was a, a paperback edition selling for about forty quid, so mm -hmm. absolutely mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, and so, so the real purpose was not so much a new edition, but to make sure that the original edition mm -hmm. stayed in print. Now there are some uh, very minor differences, but I mean the, the typography is basically the same. And uh, and actually having Richard's uh, discussion of common sense. Uh, as part of the introduction, I mean that—that's one of the, the important changes here, um, and it's also 
and nicer book than, than the last one was and, and cheaper. So, so, I mean, that's, that's really it. Having said that, I think you're making a very good point there because what would be a superb project would be a seriously annotated edition of the democratic intellect. I mean, a real new edition uh, because there is so much power or, uh, to stimulate debates within that book. And uh, should that ever be possible? I mean, I think you can kind of group a PhDs working on it or something like that. And, and I mean, it'd be a long-term project to actually get that done. Um, there has been no attempt to do that here whatsoever. And our, our attempt is really just to, to keep it up and running as a, as a text for people. I think that in, a, in a way you're not being fair to yourself on this, because in, when you come on to the, we come on to the, 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 the the sequel of this book, The Crisis of the Democratic Intellect, um, <clears throat> Murdo was very much a, a, a person who was conversing with George at the time, mm -hmm. and, 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 and as also to an extent I was as, as well. <clears throat> and, and, and I mean, quite clearly the <laughs> ideas and the scholarship is George's, but our sense of, 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 of kind of personal involvement in the Georgian world, putting oh, yeah. it that way, is, is quite a, a no, high I mean, one. I mean, yeah. I mean the simple, simple yeah. fact is that the Press of the Democratic Internet would not have come out without student support. I mean, because as usual, George, much like someone like... Yeah, yes, in other uh, works by George as, as well, yeah. publication. Yeah, because, yeah, cause, I mean, he was being ignored by mm. academia as usual, you know, in the traditional... Uh, Peter Higgs manner, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean it is ironic. But there you go, because neither neither of those two fitted in remotely well with their respective principles at the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean principles in the university they weren't fine with their own principles. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, good so, point to uh, sorry. Just, just one more thing, yeah. which is I, I know yeah. that you want to move on to the conversational stage. Yeah. I'm so excited by the stimulus here. I want well, to that, share. That's something. all right. We'll still talk to you during the next. <laughs> <phase>. <laughs> <laughs> so, just a, just a thought, when we're talking about common sense, I mean, in some sense, the, the common sense has to materialize itself in words are a way to do that. So I was actually interested suddenly in the, the name of this shop, which I love, Word Power, mm. to reify is to bring into existence uh, an idea by naming it. Mm. So I'm actually struck by the notion that this world of common sense is the naming of that which uh, we believe is common mm -hmm. that it becomes the sort of the, the, the thing the pillar around which we spin but you know what's going to happen the moment i say something is common you're going to disagree with it i mean the, 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 I mean, the point about common sense is that it exists in and through the, the flow which, 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 of interaction mm -hmm. and conversation that is the entire point of why <laughs> 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 we're all missing the opportunity but i'm sure we all have a lot to, to, to say to each other and and i hope we're going to continue for as long as dalosh will actually well, that's the, the difference is between the questions and the conversation, you go and get wine. But, but I, I have to say that this is a wonderful Christmas present. <laughs> to yourself, possibly. Very, very possibly, yeah. In fact, most people I find need two or three copies. <laughs> yeah. I say, okay. yeah. yeah, there you go. Uh, so, uh, thanks to everybody. Yeah, very good. Okay. I didn't realize that the difference was between conversation and question. Going to get a look. I wonder if I could move this way. Coming from a psychological perspective, <laughs> and then I'll just move it off. <laughs> it, it's. it's uh, one starts to realise just how deeply one has learned psychology. When one, your form of common sense is antithetical to mine, yeah. because the psychological and specifically social psychological and common sense is that there is no such thing, and the way to get past the common sense as a value judgment. You know, you should have more yeah. common yeah. sense, don't do stupid things. Yes, almost. Um, exactly like the opposite of yours. Yeah. Yet it comes to the same thing. My relativism within psychology is exactly the same as your common sense. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, the actual problem is that uh, soci sociologists never read Thomas Reed. That's the real issue. Sociologists. 
But <laughs> if, <laughs> but if they'd allowed Geddes to set up sociology, which he did actually try to do, then everything would have been on repeat. I certainly know when I the last time I went to Edinburgh mm. thinking of um, doing a PhD, um, I was looking at three um, supervisors to do feminist psychology. But um, I agree entirely with the notion that everything should be cross fertilized I was thinking when you were talking about um, a flat hierarchy um, of an autocracy, which. Silicon Valley. What's in the top Um, 1970 Topher. It's the notion of um, flexible working. Oh, okay. oh, no, 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 that's, that's very, very much so. Uh, I mean, the, the crucial thing being that, I mean, within, I don't know, democratic intellectualism, intellectualism, if it's applied to um, education, is simply the uh, expertise is, is always respected, but always questioned. Yes. <laughs> and funnily enough, if you look at the expertise... Oh, uh, oil. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 Tell me just to go away when you yeah. end up talking yeah. to me. Oh, yeah. 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 Good to see you. So glad you're here. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was on bread. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. George, I'm just a the expertise is the, the um, result of removing a lot of common sense. Expertise goes A B C D A B D A B D A D and removes B and C. Could it be thought of as building? Hey, common sense. So expertise is as a way of uh, revealing the, the, the nature of uh, reality and codifying it into a language that anybody can then learn. Yeah. Possibly. It, to, to people who like the notion of um, jargonese, then it's short hat. But if you look at the history, of um, <coughs> medicine, it's, it's, a, it's a form of, um, again, it's a hierarchy. Yeah. Keeps people out. Right. Unless you know what onomatopoeic is, or an ontology, or an epistemology, then you're not going to be able to join in. Uh, very true, very true. Which is drink. why I, I like drinking the internet. <laughs> I'm sorry I missed last Thursday. 